Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. It has been a while since I've made one of these update videos. Haven't really had a lot of time on account of uh, our house sliding down the side of a hill. And it's also the fact that um, I want to try doing monthly updates instead of weekly updates because it uh, takes about a three, four hours out of uh, every Saturday to put one of these together. So I figured once I'm in the flow, it might be easier to just do the bulk of it. So we're going to try to do monthly updates instead of weekly and see how it goes. Also, I got myself a little upgrade to the video editing rig, something that hopefully will be able to speed up my video editing process, especially when it comes to music mixing. Check this out. <laughs> I am so excited. So why don't we take a look at what we've been doing for the past month and a half in terms of game dev progress. I'm getting to the point in my life where not having a bunch of finished games under my portfolio is legitimately starting to look kind of scary. So um, since the last projects that I've been working on, which includes Child of Ether, Artec Rise, um, the Angler, the Space Adventure Project, and probably Atomicon. I think those are pretty solid projects to focus on, aside from uh, little mini games for our website. So, the only thing is that this technically is an open world survival quest based adventure game. So, there's a lot of content to go through. Uh, I needed to push something out. I need to get some sort of a playable, minimal version of the game out there that's out in the open, that's accessible. I can start building the player base. I can start getting input from users. I can start actually moving this thing forward that isn't just sitting on my computer. And the biggest question here is how can I even approach the idea of getting this thing finished to the point where it is playable? I mean, remember, these are pretty much mostly solo projects. Aside from perhaps Angler and some of the preliminary help with uh, Atomicon, most of these projects are just done by me by myself. And trying to scope out what an entire game experience feels like and how much work has to be put in order to realize that experience is kind of an overwhelming thought. So what I decided to do is maybe try to draw from some of the experiences with other indie games that I've played in the past. And it wasn't until we had a recording session with uh, me and Tim playing um, The Forest for our channel that I realized that there's a very particular similarity between The Forest and Subnautica. You see, in both cases of The Forest and Subnautica, these games had come out as early access titles and they primarily focused on survival aspects of their game long before they had introduced any sort of narrative uh, background. We played The Forest way, way back when it came out, uh, I think 2014, and we had a lot of fun. The game had a lot to offer. Uh, no story, it's just all survival stuff, all survival mechanics and combat against the cannibals, and that's about it. It was just interesting to do just that. Now, in contrast to this, I played Subnautica when it was way, way, way past its due date. Uh, when Subnautica 2 was already out for a couple of months. So I figured when I was playing that game, I was basically getting the full game as it is meant to be experienced. But what caught me off guard is when I went to YouTube to take a look at, let's say, Markiplier's Let's Play to compare his experience and his surprised face when he discovers the plot twist that I did, and admittedly, I was disappointed to see that most of the plot twists and most of the secrets and most of the really cool, interesting encounters have pretty much been spoiled by chat that he was reading at the beginning of each episode instead of discovering them by himself. But that is besides the point. What's interesting about this is that Markiplier had played the game when it just came out back when it basically had placeholders for resources. There were just cubes with icons on them. There were no meshes for most of those resources. There weren't as many locations. As a matter of fact, the landing beach location was pretty much the only one you had access to. Um, there weren't as many crafting recipes. There weren't as many enemies, but it was still fun to play. So if I compare the two games, The Forest and Subnautica, both of those games came out as early access titles and they focused on the core, which is survival. Now, here in Child of Ether, the core 
is survival. So what I'm thinking is perhaps I could try and follow in the footsteps of these successful games and by no means are these the only two games that have attempted to come out as an early access title with survival mechanics. I'm sure that there's a lot of failures out there that I don't get to know about because, well, they were failures. Nobody knows about them. But I choose to be optimistic on this. And this may very well be the answer to my question of how do I even start approaching the idea of releasing Child of Ether um, in some sort of a playable state. I could focus on the core, the survival aspect, uh, farming, combat, survival, stats, and uh, focus on those aspects, get those up and running, uh, get a day and night cycle, get weather systems up and running, and then release the game as a survival project. Then over the course of updates to push additional features while working on the main game story. Now, to be honest, when I put it this way, it doesn't sound like it's revolutionary or really anything new. I mean, game developers have been doing that for many, many years. But that doesn't help me with figuring out if I should push the game as early as possible or as late as possible during the dev cycle. Because there's successes on both ends of that spectrum. For example, the indie game Death Trash had been pushed when a good chunk of the story had already been in the game and it was pushed out as an early access. And counter to that, the Forest and Subnautica had come out pretty early in their development when they only offered a base set of survival mechanics. On top of that, there's a lot of advice and there's a lot of GDC talks concerning the planned release of your games. There's a lot of videos talking about you focusing on building up your wish list, building up your emailing newsletter list, uh, setting up your press kits, sending packets to news outlets, getting everything ready for that big release. And what I'm feeling like is maybe taking this in the opposite direction. Release the game quietly, let it have its moment of spotlight in the fresh Steam page and then be buried on page 7 as another 100 games come out that day. And then slowly and methodically build up a player base that will actually last instead of uh, relying on a huge release that sees a huge spike of players and uh, then immediately sees a drop down because people realize it's an early access title that doesn't have a lot of content to it. Because no matter what you do, no matter how many warnings you place in the game and on the page, people will still buy an early access title and still complain that it doesn't have enough content. Not that it really matters, those are usually the outliers, but it seems like there's plenty to consider when figuring out what's the best possible route for getting this game out and uh, be accessible to everybody. Nevertheless, the idea of doing a minimal playable version of the game, pushing that out and then publishing updates uh, and additional content and the story through updates is, uh, uh, I think it's a new experience for me because I have done early access that has failed. I have yet to do early access that is successful, uh, but I think doing early access that is then slowly methodically is being updated might result in a different kind of player base and a different kind of fan base than the other types of releases. So what you've been seeing me do here is essentially try to assemble a list of all the features, mechanics uh, that I think should be a part of an early access version of this game or the minimal viable product version of this game. This includes basics like growing crops, harvesting, collecting, planting, scavenging, uh, the combat mechanics, establishing perhaps a couple of interesting and mysterious locations that are locked away behind puzzles that you have to solve, some basic stuff that I think might do good to communicate what kind of game this is so that players who do play the minimal early access version of the game might be primed for what the full game is going to feel like so everybody knows what to expect. I've reached the point where I now have a whole bunch of interactable objects in the game and I've come across a case scenario where if I'm standing next to multiple objects they would both be triggered in the interaction. So what I've decided to do is to start slowly weaning the existing objects out of their old systems and switching to the good old tested, tried and established distance or proximity based interaction system. Before I had every object contain an area node which is used to detect if the player is close enough to interact with this object. But of course, 
As soon as you have multiple interactable objects next to each other, and that will undoubtedly happen, like the player dropping an item on the ground next to, say, a door, well then, which one of those objects takes precedence? So what I've done is I've moved the burden of figuring out what the interactable object is onto whoever is doing the interaction, which is the player. And the way I've done it is by placing an area node into the player, and that area node constantly detects interactable objects entering and exiting. It filters everything out by node group, so if the object is not in the node group, it is completely ignored. But what essentially happens is uh, there's an array, a list of all the nearby interactable objects. I push all of the interactable objects into that array and then anytime the player moves and some object leaves that array I simply find it in the array and remove it from there. Next I have a loop that effectively goes through the array and figures out which one of these objects is the closest one. So it's going to be based on proximity. The closest object has to be closer than the previous object. So we start comparing all the distances between all the objects. This is all done within one single for loop. And in the end of the for loop, we're either going to get the closest object in a variable, or if there are no close objects that we can interact with, the variable will contain a null. So now we have a variable that actually contains the interactable object. What we do next is simply talk to the interactable object and we say, can you check the player if you happen to be the closest interactable object? If you are, we can unlock your interaction code. Now, because there's a lot of various interactable objects, I tend to put the interaction code within that particular object. And because there are a lot of other objects that are non-interactable and they don't necessarily look too different from interactables, I have established a little point, a tiny dot, that appears next to the interactable objects, indicating that you can engage with this instance. So over the course of an hour, I have gone ahead and replaced most of the interaction code in whatever few interactable objects I have access to and uh, set up a universal system that won't trip two interactable objects at once. And going forward, any other interactable objects will basically just tap into that system. The player's already there, the variable's already there, the object simply has to check if it is the one being targeted by the player. I think at this point it was about time I have focused on one of the biggest components of this game, which is farming. So in order to do farming, I had to establish the ability to plant and harvest crops. Now if I look towards other survival games and how they handle farming, there seems to be a couple of options floating around. If you look towards Minecraft, uh, you can pretty much plant and farm just about anywhere as long as you have a dirt block. If you look at crafting or farming, in let's say Subnautica or even the forest that is only permitted within these little plantation rectangles almost like sandboxes with fertile soil in them. Now both these systems have particular benefits to them. Minecraft allows you to farm just about anywhere which means you can establish a new base and you can survive just about at any point in the game. However, the Subnautica and the Forest style farming is a lot easier to manage from the programming standpoint because you have to get the player to create this farming object, this plantation rectangle, and I mean, being able to plant stuff within that scope of the rectangle is a fairly trivial matter. You don't have to worry about the entire world being a one giant patch of soil and the player ending up growing something in a place where they shouldn't. So I liked the benefits of both systems. So what I've decided to do is put together some sort of an amalgamation of the two. The player is capable of growing crops anywhere in the world. However, they first have to lay down a fertile soil patch into which they place some sort of a type of crop which then grows over time. So it has the benefit of being able to be placed just about anywhere in the world as long as it's on solid ground and it has the benefit of being confined to the code of this one particular object which is called the fertile soil patch. It can be programmed to do all the necessary timekeeping, to progress the growth of a crop, and to detect when you are trying to harvest it or collect it so that it can drop the appropriate items. So I've gone ahead and set up a quick icon for what is supposed to represent a fertile soil patch. To be honest, it kind of looks like a turd with grass sticking out of it, but I digress. There's going to be plenty of opportunities to swap this sprite out. Now, having established the actual fertile soil patch item, you have to ask the question of where is this supposed to come from? 
In Minecraft, soil can be dug out from under you, just about anywhere in the world. There's a huge abundance of this resource, but because Minecraft is a voxel-type game, it is very easy to create thousands of these dirt blocks, which means that there's a, a very easy way of acquiring that resource. In Subnautica, the player has to look for these spheroid uh, resource chunks, uh, which are fairly abundant as well. Technically, they're not as abundant as just the dirt from under you in Minecraft, but it's not very difficult to find it. In the forest, there is no soil. You only need logs. The soil just magically manifests itself and granted suspension of disbelief will give you some leeway. You can you have some wiggle room to make things just appear out of nowhere. It's not the best, but who knows? Maybe in uh, the second The Forest game that's going to be coming out sometime soon, they will do something a bit more involved. So the way I decided to handle this in Child of Ether is by having the player look for this particular resource. It will be relatively available, scattered throughout the level. It'll be randomly generated. It will be replenished on certain time intervals. So technically the player won't be running out of this resource. However, the player does have to venture out into the wild, look for these things as they will be randomly placed throughout the forest and bring them back in order to be able to make use of this resource. When found, the player will have to use a shovel in order to dig up the individual soil patches and the amount of these patches that a single soil mount will give you will be randomly selected as well. So I've been going through the motions of setting up a texture, setting up a 3D model and exporting into Godot Tension so that I could get the whole farming scavenging thing underway. And since I was already on the subject of digging up soil, I've established a small icon for a shovel object. I've added it to the item database dictionary and uh, it appeared right away. Next, it was time to program the actual interaction, the digging process. So what I've done is I made the soil mount effectively check what kind of tool the player has equipped. And if the tool is correct, it starts loading the little progress bar, which upon completion runs a function within the soil mount that makes it give up one of the soil patch units and also decreases its scale by a tiny fraction to make it look like it's actually being used up. Now I know that sound and music is usually the last step of development, but it's kind of the reason why I got into game development in the first place. So I decided to put together a little sound effect for us digging and receiving a soil patch. I used to do a lot of scavenging for free sounds on places like freesound.org or uh, royalty free sounds on YouTube or just any any number of royalty free websites until I stumble upon Zapsplat. I gotta say this website has been pretty much a one-stop shop for all my sound effects. They have just about satisfied almost every single sound effect need for my projects. Not to mention, a lot of their sounds actually sound really good out of the box. They require fairly minimal amount of post-processing, especially for the really basic sounds that you'd find in any game, like footsteps, jumps, and stuff like that. Even then, when I combine multiple sounds together to put something unique, I very rarely have to do a lot of sound treatment. It just sounds pretty decent right out of the box. They have a free account, which allows you to download, I think, 10 sounds per hour. And they also have a membership, which means you can download unlimited sounds. You have access to their additional library of premium sounds, and you don't have to credit them um, in your credits of the game. But to be honest, I mean, at this point, I might as well put them just to have them succeed because good Lord, I've been using them in pretty much all of my projects. Of course, since I was already handling the mining and scavenging ability, I decided to add a secondary animation for digging up the soil. The only animation that was there was for chopping down trees, which of course didn't really fit the shovel. It almost looked like you were wielding the damn thing like a machete. So I had set up a quick tool animation for the icon that appears when you are digging up the soil. Of course, where the animation player in Godot Engine has come immensely useful. Like the, uh, the basic curves alone just made it such a pleasure to create these animations and not only that you can create a method track in the animation player which allows you to trigger functions at certain points in the animation like for example if you want a certain sound effect to be played at a certain time I figured at this point the lightness of the texture was making the fertile soil mount blend a little bit too much with the surrounding ground, so to make it stand out from the rest of the ground space, I have given it a slightly darker look. 
I think this is going to make it a bit more noticeable when you're out and about trying to look for these things, scavenging, exploring. And now that we've made the soil mound, it is time to create the soil patch. This is going to be a tiny little hill of fertile soil into which you place your crop. This was mostly just me experimenting with the displacement modifier and the clouds texture in Blender. I mean, Blender offers a lot of tools that allow you to generate these assets quite quickly if you know where to look for it. The placement of these soil patches is going to be done by the mouse interaction. What I've done is I've uh, shot a ray from the camera and detected whether or not what it is colliding with is the soil beneath. So you can't place patches on other patches, you can't place patches on trees, you can't place patches on top of your roof. As a matter of fact, if whatever the mouse is colliding with isn't in the group solely directed for the ground, the terrain you're walking on, you won't be able to place the soil patch on it. And this alone is going to give us the ability to make sure you don't place a soil patch in place where it's not supposed to be, while still opening up pretty much the entire terrain for planting your crops. Then I finally decided to make the bushes actually have collectible berries. The bushes were one of the first assets I've made for this game and all it was is a test of how I would go about making the player interact with the bushes. You walk up to them, you press the use button and the bush kind of wiggles a little bit and substitutes its uh, sprite for the version without any berries. You didn't actually get any berries so I figured probably a good time to uh, give that ability. And that all started with us adding the item icon for the berries. Speaking of items in your inventory, the method I use to handle items in the game is pretty much this one modular process of defining the item in a dictionary called item database. Essentially, it's a dictionary containing key value pairs pertaining to the basic information about the item, the name, the key, the icon, uh, value, weight, any information that might be important in the scope of this item. Now, I've seen a lot of YouTube videos about inventory systems in Gadot, and what people like to do is to create a custom custom resource and then store the information about an item within the physical item node uh, or the item slot node. I personally am not a huge fan of that because it adds extra overhead when you want to do saving and loading system because now you have to scan through each and every single inventory slot and collect all the information and it just it's just my personal preference. I don't like to scatter things that much. I like to have a more modular approach to a lot of the systems in my games which is why I usually tend to store things like items within the node that owns that item. So the player, or maybe the master node, would be the one to hold the entire inventory. The entire player's inventory, that is. And the item slots simply dive into that dictionary and fetch the icon, fetch the name, and display the information. They don't themselves store the information, they simply display it. Now there's a benefit to that, and it's effectively when it comes down to loading and saving, all I have to do is just load and save that one single dictionary. It also comes in handy when this is handled for level transitions, and the player's inventory from the previous level has to be also present in the player in the next level. So, just like there's multiple ways to skin a cat, programming usually has many solutions to one particular problem, and in not in all cases is one solution necessarily better than the other. This is just my personal preference. Speaking of personal preferences, the way the bush gives the item is actually very modular as well. We've already programmed the soil mount to give us the soil patch. All I did is I took the code that actually gives the player the item, put it in a master node, and told the bush to call that function, but replace the item it gives. Also, if something looks weird, no, you just have pink eye. The game looks just fine. I'm just kidding. I was working on trying to set up some sort of an environment changing system, which is uh, a system that would swap out things like the ambient lighting, fog distances, fog color, ambient color, all of the properties that you usually use to set up a, some sort of an ambiance in the level. If it's daytime but foggy, or nighttime but it's got a little bit of a mist in it, all of these effects would be achieved through the environment node. But here's the problem. There are a lot of case scenarios where multiple environment properties kind of clash together. Like for example, when you transition from the outdoors to the indoors, there's supposed to be a pretty major environment change taking place to properly represent the interior environment and exterior environment. This usually concerns the fog amount, ambient color amount, design of the background sky. A lot of these things started conflicting with one another and that would present a problem. 
At this point, I don't know if this is possible, but I kind of wish Godot Engine was capable of blending multiple environments together, considering that two environments share the same exact properties. So maybe some sort of an interpolation function might be nice. And nevertheless, I had to start developing my own system that would allow me to account for multiple lighting types, multiple fog amounts, multiple fog properties and colors, ambient lights, ambient colors, energy amounts, sky contribution between the multiple zones that the player would be able to traverse. I mean, the player can go into a swampy area, which means that the entire ambience, including the fog, should assume a more greenish tint. When the player goes underwater, I have to then repurpose the fog to give it some blue tint to get that murky underwater look to it. Of course, the problem is that it all uses the one single environment node, and you're only allowed to have only one environment node. So conflicts start to crop up when I want to dynamically do a day and night cycle paired with foggy environments or swampy, murky water environments, it just becomes a nightmare. So I started experimenting with putting some functions together uh, and having some sort of an environment in a singleton that basically exists everywhere. And depending on which zone you walk into, the environment would start changing. But there's so many conflicts that can crop up because you might be overlapping multiple types of conditions together. Like you're in a foggy time zone, but also you're underwater. Mm, right? So lots and lots of conditions to think through. And I have yet to come up with a system that blends multiple environments and conditions together well. Next, I took a moment to fix up some texturing issues on the protagonist's house. Um, I made this model oh so many years ago, back before I even got into Godot Engine, and uh, unfortunately I do not have the original Blender project, so I had to import the GLTF file from Godot Engine project and uh, try to fix up some UVs and merge some vertices, you know, do some major cleanup and uh, get everything reestablished. Gotta tell you, it was kind of annoying trying to get all the textures to line up together, but we got it to a more or less reasonable result. Another total bitch and a half of a system that I have to put together is the sound and music system. Primarily music, because there's a lot of different zones the player can go into that have to have a unique soundtrack to them, or some sort of a soundscape, some sort of an ambiance. It is kind of tricky to play multiple tracks at once in such a way that they do not mess with each other. And it took me a little while to come up with a system that allows me to trigger different soundtracks based on the zone that the player walks into and make the whole transition fairly smooth and unintrusive. I initially tried to use two audio players and then flip-flop between them, swapping the tracks that they play, but that became a huge problem if the player was on the knife's edge between two zones, constantly re-triggering which soundtrack they were in. So I ended up making a more flexible, more dynamic system where every time the player walks into a new zone, it tells all of the previous soundtracks to start fading out at a certain duration and it instances a new audio player that starts slowly feeding in the soundtrack of the zone. So technically, if the player flip-flops between two zones rapidly, it would simply create a new track uh, every time a zone is entered or exited, while the previous tracks are told to quietly fade out and uh, yeet themselves out the window. Of course, we're slowly creeping up to the farming part of the game, so I've gone ahead and established a pretty basic farming crop that you'd find in any survival game, wheat. I gotta say, I struggled with the icon for this item for quite a bit until I looked at some actual references and some example sketches of what wheat is usually represented like in other games. Just goes to show people, use references. And as we've established, adding a new item to our game is as simple as popping into the item database dictionary and defining a new key value pair containing all the information about this item. I also permitted myself to do a little bit of a polish on the planting mechanic. Instead of just plucking down a soil mound, instead I make it grow out of the ground, which is an effect that I've seen used in another game, but I can't recall which one. 
might have been Age of Mythology now that I think about it. And of course, now that we can plant the actual fertile soil patches, it is time to give them the ability to grow the actual crops. Now, again, I'm trying to think of this in a fairly modular fashion. I want to make sure that the player could grow many types of crops without me doing many lines of code. So again, the modular approach to it dictates that uh, I simply have to program the soil patch to grow whatever crop you put into it and then define what types of yields the particular crop that you're inserting is going to drop when you are harvesting. And to stay true to the 2D, 3D-esque nature of this game, the soil patch will actually display a sprite of the crop that you're trying to grow within. And of course, just to make it look nice, I decided to give it two stages of growth. The low stage when you have just planted it and the grown up stage where you're going to be able to harvest it and get the yield. So for now, there's only two stages, but I am contemplating on doing three specifically so that the player would have an option to collect the crops prematurely, not receive the full benefits, but at least have something. Maybe there's uh, an emergency, right? player ventured on an adventure and then when they come back they are hungry they're dying of starvation and they need to quickly chow down on something otherwise they're gonna die with the wheat sprites done i now have the ability to make the patches actually grow the crop this was a fairly trivial manner of setting up a timer and uh, making the timer count down until the crop would turn from a planted to a fully grown one the player can place down a fertile soil patch, select a crop in their hotbar, and then press interact while being next to the patch. It will automatically insert the seed, and when the timer runs out, the crop will grow. Of course, here we have everything running in an accelerated pace so that I could test out the code to see if it's working. There is a bit of a problem though, and it's the fact that these crops will literally stop growing as soon as I enter a house, because the timers, do not exist when you're in a different scene. We end up resolving this issue a little bit later. To collect the crops, I decided to involve a special tool, a sickle, and this tool will be used to collect the crops that have fully grown. I am contemplating on giving the player the ability to collect crops without a tool, but maybe reducing the yield a bit. You know, maybe something gets damaged. Um, I'm really not entirely sure how it would go about this system. Maybe I'll drop the sickle altogether and just let the player collect the crops as it is. Because if I look towards, let's say, games like Minecraft, Subnautica, and The Forest, they don't involve a custom tool just for collecting the crops. So, who knows? Maybe I'll fall in the footsteps of those games, or maybe I'll insist on doing something unique to this particular project. As usual, we set up a quick key value pair in the item database dictionary, and we have the item in the game. Mind you, there are a lot of properties that I'm skimming over, like the value, the weight, and a couple of others, because they're currently trivial, as something like the value would only come in handy when there's a merchant involved, and something like the weight might come in handy later on when I'm actually implementing the survival mechanic that makes you have a limited carry weight. Now, one thing that kind of drives me up the wall about some survival games is when they program an entire separate object that serves only the purpose of providing it with one single item. So what I'm attempting to do is squeeze out as much usage out of each and every item in the game as possible. And this means that wheat doesn't just drop the consumable seeds. Along with the seeds, it also drops a stack of hay, which the player would be able to use on things like torches and starting fires. Next, I decided to address the issue of the fact that crops do not grow unless I am present in the scene with the crop. So this basically means that if we have, let's say, multiple levels, like multiple zones, uh, and we place crops in both of those zones, there's no way to leave for the next zone and then come back and harvest the crops that have been growing all this time. And this has to do with the fact that the timekeeping is all done within the crop itself, which means when you leave the scene, the timer is also destroyed so how can you do the timekeeping so i had to rewrite the system to account for timekeeping outside of the level that you're 
planting. Now, this was done by establishing a singleton, which is capable of simply doing all the timekeeping. It has a single variable that stores the current amount of seconds that has passed in the game. Or technically, we use seconds, but we refer to that as minutes. And what happens is that when you plant a crop, instead of using timers, the crop takes a look at the current time and it takes a look at a dictionary where the growth times have been defined and it takes the current time, adds to that the growth time from its uh, definition and says when the time is this, the crop is supposed to be fully grown. So essentially, instead of doing active timekeeping, the crops simply pre-calculate what time is supposed to be when the crop fully grows. And that's it. After that, it's just a matter of looking up that uh, singleton, looking that variable in the singleton, and simply checking if that time is now in the past. If it is, the crop is fully grown, it substitutes the sprites, it sets up the yield, and it stops doing all the time checks. And because the time progression is handled within a singleton, it exists outside of the scope of any scene that your game takes place in. So you could be walking into a house, going into a basement, being transported to a parallel dimension, time still flows. And I think this particular solution is a bit more elegant than having each and every single crop contain a timer that does its own timekeeping. Do a quick test. Plant, pluck, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and bam. Okay, so now plant, plant, enter. Three, four, five, six. So the timer keeps running, keeps uh, calculating the time. Okay, so we should be able to see... Yep, so it's fully grown. Okay, so crops can actually grow when we are inside of a building now. The next issue that cropped up was the fact that once you place a fertile soil patch, you cannot pick it back up, and that's of course not really a good idea. And we've already programmed the soil patch to be interactable with the sickle, so now we have a kind of a conundrum. A single object only has one tool that is supposed to be used on that object. If you have a fertile soil mound, then you're supposed to use a shovel on that. If you have a soil patch, you're supposed to use a sickle on it. But now we've come to the point where multiple tools should be usable on a single object. So what I've done is uh, taken a variable that stores what kind of tool the soil patch can interact with and I've retrofitted it into an array. So this means that I am capable of defining multiple tools that a single object can be interacted with. And what happens is when the player is next to the object and has one of those tools equipped, the tool usage progress bar will appear. Once it fills up, it will trigger the function, the interaction function inside of that object, and it will also send the name of the tool that was just used on this item. So now within this object, I can program the detection of which tool was used and the appropriate response based on the tool chosen. So now if the player uses a sickle on the fertile soil patch, it will drop the appropriate uh, yield based on the loot table, which in this case would be a few seeds and some hay. But if the player uses a shovel, the entire soil patch will be picked up and the seed will be dropped. I'm also contemplating on implementing some sort of a penalty of uh, you getting slightly less of a yield if you use the wrong tool. But of course, it's all about framing. People like to be rewarded for doing things right rather than punished for doing things wrong. So it's a simple fact of changing the description of saying that a sickle will usually produce much larger yield. It's a little tidbit of wisdom I've learned from one of the GDC videos. And since I was already in the code of the fertile soil patch, I figured I would also take into account what happens when the player decides to extract the yield 
prematurely before the crop has had enough time to grow up. So what I've done is uh, essentially gone into the dictionary that defines what kind of yields this particular crop has and set up the various stages that the crop can be in. So when the crop is in the early stage, if you wait long enough, it will grow up. And when you harvest it in that state, you generally get more items and you get more of each item. However, if you decide to pick up the crop when it is basically in its infancy, you will essentially simply get the seed in return, no matter at which point in time you decide to harvest it. As long as it hasn't reached maturity, you're simply going to get your original seed back. Believe it or not, I was so engrossed in producing the growth code and the, uh, the the proper yield code that I didn't even consider that the player might end up prematurely collecting the crop. So it's one of those things you don't realize until you actually start producing the system. And then you start realizing that there's all these case scenarios that can happen that essentially need to have exceptions be programmed in case they take place. Over the course of the past few development sessions, I've ended up adding quite a few inventory items. And up until this point, in order for me to test the items or test functionality that uses that item, I have pretty much just been reusing the function that the soil mount and the soil patch use to grant me the item. I just put it into a timer and when the player enters the level, a second passes, the loading code has finished running, and then I receive an item in the inventory. The problem with that is, uh, well, Every time I want to get a new item to test something, I have to close the game, restart it, recompile it, do this whole thing, and it's just taken up too much time. So I guess it's about time I've implemented some sort of an admin panel, or I should say a developer panel, kind of like the creative mode panel in Minecraft, where you can basically requisition any type of block you wish. The cool thing is that it barely took any programming at all, because I've simply piggybacked off of all the assets I have already created. The master node has the item database, which is technically there for the sole purpose of allowing any object in the game to grant me any item I wish without having to program a single additional line of code. Now, I piggybacked off of that function, and for the admin panel itself, I simply reused the inventory slot that we already use in our player and chest inventory. We quite literally just set up a new object, we gave it its own dictionary, and we simply told it, hey, pop into the master node, duplicate the entire item database, and uh, just populate it into your own dictionary, into the numbered inventory slot, and we're done. So. This is the beauty of modular programming. You simply piggyback off of the existing systems you have already developed and your development time just speeds up immensely. This also means that if I start adding additional items to my inventory into the item database, this admin panel will automatically have those items as well. I don't have to lift a finger to add them there either. So it was time to switch gears a little bit and address something that technically I've already tackled before, but to be honest, I didn't really produce a very satisfactory solution. The combat system. Uh, before I was trying to experiment with the combat system in a way that uh, is a bit different from what has already been established. I didn't really want to make another clicker where you just point the mouse at the enemy and left click and let your player character handle all the combat. And I also didn't really want it to all be based on player stats like a classical RPG game would have. In this game, I do want to have the player be a little bit more involved in the combat. So it's uh, more skill-based rather than strategy-based. And previously we had established a combat system where the enemy has a bunch of these little orbs uh, floating around them, and then you have to swipe through them with the mouse in order to attack them. The problem is that uh, that was actually causing quite a bit of strain on the wrist because the dots are very small and they move very rapidly and it's kind of it's more annoying to try to hit them rather than exciting or interesting or challenging. It's just a bitch and a half to try to hit one of them. So what I decided to do is kind of step away from that system and do some other stuff in the meantime. Well, some other stuff has been done and I was thinking, God, what am I going to do with this system? Um, and a particular idea crossed my mind uh, to still use the same mouse based combat, but instead of making the player try to hit these teeny tiny points, which was the sole super annoying part of it, was to instead blow the point up, make it invisible, 
and make it look like you're actually hitting the enemy. So the enemy would have a bit of a wiggle in it when you hit it. So instead of doing the Fruit Ninja style combat, where you have to very precisely slash through a little point, you just have to move your mouse generally across the enemy that is standing in front of you. Now, this meant that the margin for error was a lot more forgiving. It was actually harder to miss the enemy in this type of combat. So this means that you are still involved in the combat and the faster you swipe or the further you swipe, the more damage you're gonna deal. And this also allows me to still try to implement some offensive features where the enemy can throw some attacks and you have to deflect them with the mouse. There's still more experimentation to be done, but this feels a lot less annoying than, you know, trying to chase down teeny tiny zits across the screen. Oh yeah, and the teeny addition to the inventory system is I've added a modifier key that allows you to hold shift and click on an item, which makes it immediately populate into the hotbar. I think it uh, made item transferring, especially for testing purposes, a lot less annoying to deal with. So as you can see here, when the enemy detects you and starts approaching you, when it reaches uh, your attack range, you gain the ability to perform an attack with the weapon or the tool that you're holding. And that's another thing. Some of the tools can be used as weapons, and this was made possible by supplying multiple types of categories for each item in the inventory, which is basically just an array saying that the ax both is a tool and a weapon, allowing it to act as both. And since I was well into the development of my survival mechanics, I decided to set up a Steam page for this project. It doesn't really contain anything that you haven't already seen in these update videos, but if you are interested in knowing when this project comes up and you might miss one of the videos, simply add this to your wish list. In retrospect, I think I've done a massive amount of progress on the farming aspect of the game, and I figured I'll uh, maybe switch some gears and entertain myself and maybe do some modeling uh, or come up with an interesting prop design. So, since this is a mystery game, what I've decided to occupy myself with is this um, prop of an entry hatch uh, that the player would discover as they are wandering the forest. This is supposed to be a mystery game. It's supposed to be a mystery horror, so there are supposed to be some mysterious locations for the player to discover, figure out how to get into, and explore. And what is more mysterious than a mysterious hatch in the middle of the forest? And this was definitely giving me flashbacks to the, uh, the Lost TV series. Man, I've said this before, but I'm a sucker for science fiction, mystery, and horror. And when those components all come crashing together, oh man, you got me hooked. So I went about modeling and texturing this whole thing in Blender. I gotta say, Blender's really gotta add more features to their texture painting toolset because um, I am definitely missing things like layers and uh, proper eraser. Luckily, the art style of this game is so simple that it's uh, pretty much just you painting in black ink over white paper. So yeah, it works out in my case. Also, if a prop is simple enough, it really doesn't need to be exported out of Blender and Textured Substance Painter. Uh, Blender pretty much offers the basic tools I need to achieve texturing of something simple as this. Of course, this hatch has to be able to open, so um, I could have rigged it in Blender and animated it there, but to be honest, um, I think that might be an overkill. I simply popped in the objects into a new scene in Godot, added an animation player node, and um, just animated the lid opening and closing in there. Um, it really offers all the necessary tools I need to pull off a pretty nice looking animation. And this is what I really like about Godot. It's just, it gives you such a huge tool set that you rarely need to rely on external tools outside of really complex animations or sprite painting or 2D animation. Now, this might come as a surprise to you, but there is actually going to be a fair bit of underwater exploration in this game. This is one of those things that uh, I really wish other games um, explored a bit more. This is actually why I like Subnautica so much, because it's pretty much all underwater exploration. But to be honest, I feel like uh, if a game is mostly based 
on the surface and it employs some underwater exploration with some interesting locations to discover underwater, I think that makes it for a much more intriguing experience. Much like if you have a game or a show that isn't inherently scary, have that one or two horror episodes in it. Or even just a game that wasn't defined as a horror game right from the get-go has that one spooky location that you go to. I think those kinds of occurrences tend to be a lot more appreciated because they're they kind of come up out of the blue and they're not they're not usual to the experience that you have been set up with so far. So that's why I think that in this game that predominantly takes place on the surface, having some underwater segments might actually be kind of interesting. I often get disappointed when I play something like Fallout 3 or Fallout 4 and um, I find this lake and I dive deep into it and there's not really a whole lot going on there. So what I've been experimenting with here is some sort of a water surface texture. And of course, just like any water, I would have to create a shader that would be doing stuff like layering multiples of these textures together, blending them in and doing some vertex offsets to give the water surface some motion. For the time being, I ended up with two textures, one depicting the water surface and the other one having a slight bit of shading into it to kind of give it a wavy look. And uh, of course, the whole thing was uh, being shifted in the shader using a time factor and a sine wave. And uh, the cool thing is that the surrounding fade that makes the water blend in with the ground was actually achieved by creating a regular spatial note, which already has proximity fade in it, and then converting that into shader and just adding my additional features to it using code. The last little bit of progress I've done was to add another mineable component. So far, the fertile soil mount was the only one in, and I decided that uh, we should probably get some rocks into the game's item database. So I've simply created a couple of spheres and used a displacement modifier with a clouds texture in order to offset the vertices in space. Very simple way of creating rocks. Uh, not only that, if you set the displacement to take place in global space, you can actually move the rock around and get a different variation of that displacement. Basically creates an unlimited rock generator. And of course, because this is a stylistically very simple game, I've simply painted the rocks in Blender right from the get-go. As a matter of fact, I placed both of these rocks onto the same texture as to save up on some space. And the texture for the rock was simply made by tracing the visible edges that I can kind of perceive by rotating my camera around the rock and then adding some scuff marks here and there. Now, of course, if we are going to be mining rocks, then we need to have an icon for the rock resource that you will be getting back. The comic book style of the whole game is really making it easy to add additional item icons. It's all within the same project and dimensions of 128 by 128 pixels gives me more than enough detail to pluck in a relatively legible silhouette for the item. And of course, we can change this up at any point in time. Of course, if we are going to be mining the rock, then we need to have some sort of a tool to mine the rock with. And as you witnessed before, adding both the pickaxe tool and the rock resource were just a matter of adding additional key value pairs into our item database. And I gotta tell you, I've been really using the heck out of that admin tool to pull up uh, items for testing. Man, what was I doing before I had this thing in place? Jeez. Now, in order to make the rock actually mineable, I simply decided to reuse the script of my soil mount. Realistically, the process is pretty much the same. You use the correct tool, so the soil mount and the rock both have to define which tool they use, so it's the same exact procedure. The player equips the tool into the hotbar, selects it, then walks up to the soil mount or the rock, and um, that's it, you can start mining it. So the code that allows you to mine the soil and mine the rock are pretty much the same. So that's exactly what I did. I simply renamed the script to be a little bit more general, like mineable resource. And I simply turned the variables that store what the object drops and what kind of tool has to be used on it into export variables. Now, I just have to apply the script to any mineable object, be it a tree, a rock, a soil pile, or any other object. And that's it. I can simply make it be mineable. I don't know what kind of childhood trauma I went through that made me go with a modular system for just about everything I make, but I am not complaining because, oh boy, does this save a lot of time. I mean, to be fair, this particular approach really allows you to create truly ginormous feature-packed games. 
Like the amount of variety you can get out of making an object mineable just by simply supplying the key of the item that's supposed to be the tool and the key of the item that's supposed to drop is quite immense. You can very rapidly add additional mineable objects into your game without having to write copious amounts of extra code, mind you. So I got both the large and the small mineable rock in place. The large boulder gives you 10 units of rock and the small boulder gives you three units. I project that the rock resource is going to be used for building campfires, building some small structures. I am currently not planning on doing any sort of structure crafting, like uh, you can do buildings in Rust or the Forest or Fallout, but who knows. One final thing that I wanted to wrap up is something that I've been planning for a very long time on a prop that has been in this project since pretty much the very beginning, and that is the torch. I wanted to be able to place torches into the game. Now, this pretty much piggybacked off of the already established mechanics of you being able to place fertile soil patches on the ground. It's pretty much the same exact concept. And the way I made the soil patches be placeable is by giving them a category type of placeable. So we already have resource, consumables, tool, weapon, and placeable. And by simply giving the item that particular keyword and its properties in the item database, it automatically makes that object become placeable. All I have to do is remember to include the scene that has to be instanced to place this object. So this is all the progress that I've made on the Child of Etha project. I'm pretty sure I've talked to years off enough for one video, but there is more updates to produce for the Angler, the Artag Rise, and um, possibly even the Atomicon project. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you stick around and join the live stream while I'm working on the games. And uh, I hope to see you in the next video.